Okay. So good afternoon again. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Monica Copeland. I'm a senior program officer at Inclusive. Um, today's webinar is on celebrating and lifting up the credit unions um, in our inclusive network that serve Native American communities. Today's agenda um, is essentially, we're gonna spend the, the hour with you today um, providing a brief Native American credit union overview and then jump into a panel discussion featuring four different credit unions across the country, uh, both in the continental US and in Alaska and Hawaii. We're so honored to have um, the following four guests with us today, Monica Bells, President and CEO of Kauai Federal Credit Union, Shana Ferguson, she's the manager of Lakota Federal Credit Union, Helen Mitchell, President and CEO of Tongass Federal Credit Union, and Stephanie Siever, CEO of Sisseton Wapaton Federal Credit Union. So we'll have a lot to discuss and it will be a facilitated discussion um, hosted by my colleague, Kathy Kim. Um, and then we're gonna have some time at the end for an audience Q and A. So you know, feel free as you're hearing from different um, speakers and presenters during the panel, feel free to type in your questions at any time and then we'll save them and try to take a few at the end. Um, this webinar today is being recorded, so if you have to you know, step away or you want to share with a friend or colleague later, um, it will be recorded and sent out to everybody who registered um, following the, the session. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, um, Kathy. Welcome. Thanks so much, Monica, and thank you everyone for sharing your morning, afternoon, evening with us. Now we have folks joining us from all across the continental US as well as Alaska and Hawaii. And it is such a privilege to have this time and space to honor um, our credit unions that are serving Native American communities. Whether we ourselves may identify as being part of, this, um, of, of Native American communities, all of us share one thing in living in this country and that we are living on lands that were um, occupied uh, by uh, Native communities. And so I'm um, gonna invite you when you have a moment to also look at the history of the land on which um, you are living. Um, you can check out websites such as native-land.ca and learn more about um, the different um, tribes that have a rich history in, in the land that either your business or your credit union is located or, or your homes. Um, so before we get into the conversation and hear from our amazing leaders, really wanted to spend a few minutes just kind of uh, setting the table to give an overview of the state of credit unions that are serving Native American communities. And I think that uh, Native American-led um, community development financial institutions and, and other uh, Native-led organizations have truly been pioneers and, and leaders in demonstrating what inclusive impact can look like, as well as um, their innovative ability to uh, really lean deeply into their communities and create regenerative um, communities, credit unions, and just approaches to relating with, with one another. Um, with that having been said, we also acknowledge that when we look at the state of financial inclusion, as well as the impacts of the COVID pandemic, one of the communities that have been impacted the, the most disparately have been um, our Native-led communities. Just one note about that, while I'll be using the term uh, Native American, really want to, to clarify and share one learning um, that I've been privileged to come uh, across is really that this term Native American encompasses both communities and tribes that uh, are in the continental US, as well as Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians, and that this is a very broad and diverse a diaspora which really rich histories. With that having been said, um, we know that when we look at the state of financial inclusion and the impact of the, the COVID pandemic, unfortunately uh, Native communities have been some of the most hardest hit. More than 40% of Native Americans are either unbanked or underbanked, making them more vulnerable to predatory financial services and um, this is also due to the, the lack of access to mainstream um, financial institutions in um, Native-led communities. And that's when we also turn to uh, leaders like those we have on the call today. Um, 
and we look forward to sharing the stories with, with you. We did want to take a moment to also acknowledge those that came before us, real leaders within the, um, the broader key development financial institutions uh, movement, and there's just so many to name, but just wanted to take a moment to um, acknowledge the leadership of Elise Corbell, who's a member of Black Tech Nation and was truly one of the leading forces in the development of the CDFI fund. Um, Elsie Meeks, who is also on the board of Lakota Funds, um, and Robin Danner, who has been doing tremendous work in working with uh, Native Hawaiian communities towards uh, sustainable and inclusive economic development. Um, so real high level sort of snapshot of Native American credit unions based on the MCUA call reports. As of June 30th, 2021, about 26 uh, credit unions identified as being led by and serving majority um, Native communities. Collectively, they represent $3.8 billion in assets and provided $2.3 billion in loans to members of their community. Collectively, they serve more than 308,000 members. And so really, um, this, this is a movement. And we are so honored here today to really share more about and share stories and listen to some of the leaders on, on, in our industry and in our movement today. So with no further ado, want to pass the mic over to our esteemed panelists. Maybe start with um, Shana. Um, Shana, can you please tell us about your credit union where it's located, uh, the members that you serve, a brief history, and maybe even also personally how you became involved with um, Lakota? Yeah, sure. Um, well, for everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at. Thank you for allowing me this time to come forward and kind of talk about who we are, where we're at, what we're about, what we're doing, what we plan on doing, and all the good stuff. So thank you again. I am Shana Ferguson. I am the manager of Lakota Federal Credit Union. We are located in Kyle, South Dakota, which is the southwestern side of, of South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. We're a very really new, newly chartered credit union. We were chartered in 2012. Um, it took us about two years to get that charter. The first native CDFI Lakota funds was actually the sponsoring entity of our credit union. They got the ball rolling. Um, Elsie Meeks, actually, we, uh, she was kind of one of the ones that, that figured, you know, the credit union was needed here on the reservation. So it was about two years that, that it took for the credit union to get chartered, which finally was chartered in 2012. Uh, we blew the projections out of the water. We expected a thousand members by year two. By six months, we had that. You know, we, we've been, you know, charging ahead so far. We're about nine, a little over nine, oh, excuse me, 10 million in assets, about 3,300 members. The population of the reservation is about 40,000, so there's plenty of potential there. The size of our reservation, I like to kind of reference it to the size of Connecticut, because that's how vast we are, where we're pretty large, uh, kind of one of the largest reservations in the US. Um, of course, when everyone hears Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, we are popular for being one of the poorest counties in, in the US, unfortunately. Uh, and that's another reason why the credit union being here is, is very important. Um, well, my journey with the credit union, I was actually a Lakota Funds loan client employee. <laughs> so, so they kind of stole me for the credit union. So it's been a long journey with Lakota Funds and, and the credit union. So, so that's kind of how I got started. Um, we started pretty, pretty small with just savings accounts only for many, many years. Uh, even though it was just savings accounts only, it, the members utilized it a lot. Uh, it wasn't until 2016 when we got the ball rolling with checking accounts. Um, now we're pretty, pretty proud and pretty happy to announce that we are offering mortgage lending on, on tribal trust land. So, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, we also do uh, credit cards, which is a brand new product for us as well. Um, trying to pave the way on the reservation and make it a lot easier for our members and future members. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing your story, uh, Shana. Monica, can you tell us more about your credit union, um, as well as the members and the communities that you serve. Hey, aloha from the beautiful island of Kauai, as you can see in the backdrop here. A little overcast today, but it's gorgeous. Um, so we are, we actually changed, we shortened our name yesterday. So we are now officially Kauai Federal Credit Union, formerly Kauai Government Employees Federal Credit Union. We were founded in 1947. Um, we uh, were founded um, with financing some of the island's first police vehicles because police officers at the time were, uh, they had to finance their own police car. 
Um, so it's a kind of a fun story. Um, we are on an island that has about 70,000 residents. Uh, that's our population here. We have one road. It goes almost in a circle around the island, um, except there's a mountain range that prevents that circle from connecting. So we're, we're a pretty um, tight knit and vulnerable island community. Um, we've experienced some pretty large disasters throughout the years, hurricanes, flooding and whatnot. So um, it's been quite an honor just to be a part of a community that's so interconnected um, and able to, to be resilient uh, regardless of what mother nature does. Um, and I, I got involved in the credit union. I actually worked at another credit union as an executive and the CEO was retiring here. And as you guys know, in small credit unions, um, CEOs retire, they tend to merge, but that doesn't have to happen. So go be a CEO of a small credit union. Um, we are babies in the native CDFI space. We just obtained our CDFI in 2020 during COVID actually. So I'm honored to be here and learn from all of these wonderful experts today. Thanks so much, Monica. On that note, since you mentioned also work with uh, your history with smaller credit unions, I want to turn it over to Stephanie Sievers, who also um, has some stories and done tremendous work with uh, some of our, our smaller credit unions in the movement. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, y'all. Um, so I'm Stephanie Sievers, and I'm with the Sisseton Wapaton Federal Credit Union. We're located in Agency Village, South Dakota. We serve um, the members and employees of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate of the Lake Traverse Reservation. We have the area school employees, the Indian Health Services and Bureau of Indian Affairs. Our credit union is older. We've been open since 1978, so a little over 40 years. We have about six and a half million in assets and um, a little over 1500 members. The credit union, although almost 40 years, is also new to CDFI. So we did not actually get that until, um, I think it was about uh, 19, 18, 19 is when we started, 18 is when we started applying. And um, so we were always uh, MDI and low income, but uh, we had never really gone after that before. So I got involved with the credit union because they were in a vulnerable situation. We had a longtime CEO. And uh, you know, as you heard, right, y'all know, longtime CEO passes away. Um, then it's kind of unexpected and there's no real leadership back behind it to support it. And so that's really where I was brought in to help transition the credit union into its new era of success and you know, um, kind of lead it forward. And honestly, we needed to do some growth. We've had to completely rehire and train the staff um, internally. So that's been a transition for us. Thanks so much for sharing that, Stephanie. I definitely want to put a pin in that and circle back to um, that, that organization redevelopment journey. Um, then we're going to zoom over to Alaska and turn the mic over to Helen. Hi, Helen. Can you tell us more about Tongass Federal Credit Union and the communities you serve, um, as well as how you became involved with the movement? Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm Helen Mickle with Tongass Federal Credit Union in Ketchikan, Alaska. I am, we are located in Southeast Alaska in the Tongass National Forest, and um, we are on one of the islands in the Alexander Archipelago. We serve uh, eight communities on six different islands in Southeast Alaska. And we were opened in 1963 by teachers who were not able to get loans because of their seasonal income. And they wanted to be buy, able to buy homes and, and vehicles and participate in the community. So the credit union got started back then. And uh, we became a community charter in uh, the late 1990s, 99, I believe. And, um, and in 2005, Wells Fargo had purchased a local regional bank um, and they'd been in, um, in the community of Metlakatla, which is the only native Indian reserve in Alaska. And um, they, after Wells Fargo purchased that regional bank, they stayed there for a couple of years and then they said, oh, it, the economy here is terrible and we're leaving you. And so they left uh, on that island uh, where Metlakatla is located and, and the leaders in, uh, in Metlakatla were like, what are we gonna do? 
we need financial services. They were accustomed to having a bank there since the 70s. And so they came over to Ketchikan, which is a, about a 10 to 12 minute float plane ride um, to talk to some local financial institutions here. And I think actually think that we might have been last on their list, but they came walking up the stairs and talked to the current CEO at the time and said, you know, we need we need a bank in uh, Mount Lakatla. And she said, I'll help you open a credit union. And they're like, no, we just want a branch. Just bring a bank over. And so um, that's that was our first branch. We hadn't really looked at doing a branching strategy at that time. We were able to serve that community because of the area we had um, expanded to when we got our community charter. And we first started by just flying over there twice a week and doing some transactions. It was in the summer, thankfully, because the weather can be pretty dicey in the winter. And, um, and they gave us the location where Wells Fargo was because of course it was on trust lands on leased property and Wells Fargo just left their building. Um, and so we started providing services in Metla Catla. And, and in 2010, 2012, we built a new a completely new building over there and um, we've been there ever since and, and it's been a wonderful experience and relationship with the Metlakantla Indian community. We provide some extra services there. Probably don't want to get into that too much but I'll tell you a little bit more about um, we are also serving other Alaska Native communities through our community microsite um, initiative where we open up a community microsite. It's open three days a week part-time and we are inside a sponsor organization and they provide us uh, space for free, free rent. And it's just like a little office with one or two teller stations and we're only there about 12 hours a week, but um, it's been a wonderful uh, partnership with these organizations and they are mostly tribal organizations that we are um, partnering with. Thanks so much for sharing that story, Helen. And um, really, I think there's there's so much to what you shared and what the movement, seeing what others might see as, as challenges, as opportunities. And there's truly been so much growth um, in Tongas as well as the impact that you've had in, in um, advancing the community of microenterprises um, in your part of Alaska. I'm gonna pivot a bit and just maybe follow up on Part of your story, um, Helen, you don't identify as an Alaskan native, but as CEO, a lot of the, your growth and expansion has come with that explicit focus. Um, some of the folks who've joined us for today's webinar are also interested in learning more how, about how they might be able to expand the services or, or be an effective ally and a true community partner. Um, and would love to kind of hear from you on what that journey has been like, any best practices that you'd like to share for folks who um, might not have the experience or the history yet, but are really looking to um, be a, a, a stronger community partner for Native-led communities. Uh, well, I can, I mean, I, our experiences have been different in, in our different communities, but let me start with Metlakatla. Uh, when we first opened up over there, as I said, it was our first branch and we were kind of like, you know, what are we doing? We're just gonna open a branch and hire some people and do some stuff. But we got involved with the leaders from Metlakatla Indian community who actually came to us. And so we already kind of had this um, open communication and, and relationship. Um, and then when we when we went ahead and started moving forward, we established a uh, an advisory board over there. So we had, and it was kind of wide open. There were no rules about how many people could be on the advisory board and it ranged from, you know, like seven to 12, I think, depending on who was interested in being a part of that. And that way we were able to really hear from the community, the things that they needed and wanted. Um, I don't know if there's a question later on about extra services that we're providing. I could talk about that later, but we were really listening to what they wanted. And, um, and one of the things that they asked us for was uh, we, when we built the new building, they said, well, it'd be really neat if we had a sign that kind of um, represented our culture and our community. And, and we thought that's a really great idea. So we got in touch you know, with our advisory group and we uh, put out a request for a proposal from artists to create a, a logo for us. And, um, and we did get a logo, it, we call it the Spirit of the Tongas logo. Actually, the artist called it that. It's, his name is David R. Boxley. He's actually a, a famous form line artist. He has um, some carvings at the Smithsonian. Uh, but he's a local carver uh, that lives over in Metlakatla. He learned from his dad, who is also David Boxley. 
And um, anyway, so that it, it was really wonderful. We had a, um, a special ceremony when we put up the new sign and with dancing and um, it, it was really great. So I think that, you know, really just listening to the community and the things that they want and, and having some great leaders. Shana and I were talking for a minute before we started here about Denise Hudson, who's our manager over there and, and her assistant manager, Jade, and, um, and they're wonderful, uh, you know, ambassadors in the community for the credit union and, and really good at sharing experiences um, and, and needs that the community might have. Thanks so much for, for sharing that, that Helen. Um, Daphne and Monica, do you have um, anything that you'd like to add about your own uh, experience in, in working with um, the Native communities uh, in um, your credit union's footprint? Um, so we didn't, you know, <laughs> so for us, we asked our members, you know, what they wanted to, and it was really interesting the credit union, like I said, we've been around for uh, 40 years and had mostly just been maybe like a savings and loan, what you would think of back in the day, very small savings and loan um, and very much relationship focused with everybody coming in. And it's not that that's a bad thing, but where we're also located, we get some pretty bad inclement like weather issues with snow and everything. And so our members had just started to ask us to really step up and kind of move into the um, 21st century, really, you know, getting debit cards and online banking and mobile apps and things like that. So ours, um, our membership, that's kind of what I think maybe was part of why we are in a bit of a financial desert. It is very rural where we're at. And we knew that we kind of needed to do that just to, um, if we were really going to serve our members and make a difference in their lives, we really needed to be there and meet them with the services that they needed um, so that's when we went out to our members, that's kind of some of the things that we heard from them. But in reality, uh, what nobody was necessarily saying, um, but that we found out was really what they needed, or our members really needed was more financial education. Um, that was really the main thing that we needed. And, and, and it still is the thing that we need today. And I think that when you, even when we're talking about allies and advocates and just in general, I think that the more people there are out there that are offering financial education, you're just teaching more people and giving them more information, which then perpetuates them to give more information and better information to everybody else. And so I think that eventually that that impacts everyone. Um, that's really our main um, struggle probably today is in that regard. Um, but I don't, I'll go, I don't want to go left. So I'll go ahead and let um, Shane, if you want to talk about some of the needs that you guys were experiencing. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and like Stephanie, uh, our reservation uh, did not have any access to any kind of financial institution. There are, but each financial institution is about 50 to 90 miles away from, from here. So if that kind of gives you any idea. Uh, and and she's, she's spot on. You know, financial education is huge. You know, we're going from generations that are used to cashing their check at a store for 10% and hiding that money un under a mattress or in a shoe or whatever, you know, getting them to understand, you know, that what a financial institution do, especially a credit union, you know, people help them, helping people. That's the philosophy, right? And, and that's what we're here to do, you know, and, and I, I really, truly believe that. And, you know, and, and I think with us, it really helps uh, our members be more comfortable because when they come into our credit union, they see a familiar face. You know, I was born and raised here all of my staff were born and raised here, you know, and I, I think that kind of really helps it out to, um, you know, most people when they hear federal credit union, you know, as a Native American, they might shy away a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, if they're coming into a credit union and they're saying, oh, hey, I know you, you know, you know you're so-and-so's daughter. And I think that was really, really helpful. And, and I think that kind of gives them the opening to, to tell us what they need, what are they looking for? Um, and, and we've been really trying to, to, to help them with that. So that's the nice thing about credit unions. <laughs> Oh, I think Brian uh, message said uh, uh, about that's something kind of off subject here, but we're um, we're also trying to expand. So I, I know, Helen, you guys did an awesome job of expanding. We're trying to do that right now as well. Uh, the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota is, is a county over, and I believe that's seven or nine counties. I can't remember off the top of my head. We're trying to, to, to branch out and to reach over there. You know, we're, we're in the process of applying. 
haven't heard back yet, but I'm crossing my fingers. That might be some good news for us in 2022. So let's all cross our fingers for the Code of Federal Credit Union. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and um, let Monica talk to that or, or let Kathy take back over. <laughs> Hey, sure. Yeah, the only only thing I have to add. So I think specifically during COVID, um, I think we all saw new needs emerge. Um, and it sounds like, you know, the amazing women leaders here all did the same thing, which was listen um, and tr truly try to understand, like, what is the need of the community? Um, I think one of the specific things that we saw go down here and how we responded to that I think is noteworthy and has taught us a lot um, has to do with, um, so one of our, our, basically our business development outreach uh, employee, incredible leader in the community. She's from a multi-generational Hawaiian ag farm family. You know, she grew up in these fields behind me pulling taro all day while her friends are driving to the beach. So she, she really has, um, you know, deep connection to the place and to the multi-generations before her. Um, and she's got this amazing ability to speak with a kapuna and to relate with the community. So we sent her actually by her idea, she wanted to go out and do a lot of handholding because a lot of the federal aid was overwhelming. And it's honestly felt like another language to everybody, but especially to, to people who don't read legalese, you know, federal legalese every day. Um, so it was really special that she was able to go help walk people through PPP loans, especially people without computers or um, internet or you know, strong internet connectivity or people who are isolated, you know, due to the pandemic. And I think it's incredibly powerful to have leaders on your team who speak the language and who can relate with the community to understand the needs and then just trust and empower them to go meet those solutions and, and create those solutions as a credit union. Thanks so much, Monica. I mean, each of your stories are so unique, but one common thread is just the power of listening and getting building that, that collective, getting the feedback, asking folks what they need. And um, I think our, our Native-led credit unions do such a tremendous job of that and sh such a shiny example of what I think the CDFI movement is also trying to do in seeing the loans that we make, not as transactions, but opportunities for transformational impact and, and focusing on that relationship. So really appreciate you all leading by example and, and sharing your stories. Um, a few of you have shared uh, things that you're looking forward to, um, some growth opportunities, um, as well as goals and for, for your credit union and the communities that you serve. Um, can you share with folks um, joining us today just a, a bit more about um, what type of activities would help address the challenges or barriers that were shared earlier, um, or if there are any sorts of strategic goals that you're currently focused on um, and excited about in, with your credit union. Okay, I'll go. Um, so we're really excited because we finally did get all of our technology. We still have, we've implemented one ATM, we're trying to get the other, but I'm not gonna talk about that because everybody has technology that you're implementing. So that's not new, um, but I will say that some of the things that we found um, were that people were having trouble savings and saving and they were making you know, interesting decisions. So we took the idea of a mortgage and you have an escrow account for a mortgage and um, we applied it to car loans because our members were uh, paying for car insurance every month and it's a little bit more expensive than if you were to buy it over the six months. So, and then they weren't saving, they were having trouble building savings. So then if the car needed new tires, which is a thing, they're constantly needing new tires where we're at. And so if they need new tires or something's going out, uh, they didn't have the money to make those repairs. And so we basically built an escrow account, just like you do on a mortgage, where we would help them instead of having those bulk one-offs they could help save along the way. And if they didn't end up need, not needing the money for the car, then that was money that they had saved. They were able to purchase their um, car insurance cheaper because now you can buy it at the six months instead of every month. So you're getting a little bit of a discount there. Um, so that was something that we started when we started getting in and looking at um, educating our members on ways, you know, that, that was a, that came from a talk when 
you know, you don't want to repossess a car. You don't want the car to just sit there. We want them to take care of these cars. How can we help them with that? And so that kind of came out of a discussion uh, that we were having. But uh, honestly, we really found that one of our barriers, when I say it was education, I mean, it wasn't just that, but people were being taken advantage of. And both Monica and Shana kind of addressed it too, having people know your members, being part of that member, being part of the tribe. So, um, you know, knowing what's going on, same thing. Oh, I know your dad, whatever. That helps with that communication because nobody, you know, wants to pretend like they don't have financial education, right? You know what I want? So like admit that they don't, they don't have maybe that information, but we were seeing our members go to a car dealership. So we're rural. And the car dealerships are also rural. So go to a car dealership and buy a car, you're limited in options. Um, and they think that they're making a good financial decision. We had a young man who thought he was making a great financial decision. He's like, well, I'm going to buy this used car because, you know, I'm trying to save up my money. So I'm going to buy a used car instead of a new car. And I'm going to work on my credit. And you think like those things all sound like the right thing to do, except, you know, it was a 10 year old car had over 100,000 miles. I mean, they're spending $15,000 on this car because they're in a limited rural area where I'm like, well, let's look at you know, enterprise and let's see like that. You're not making good decisions. Cars are already 10 years old. Is it even going to last? This is, so I think people have a lot of good intentions. And I think that's where having those relationships to be able to go, yeah, you are making, I, your heart is in the right place. Your intentions are right. Um, but like giving you that other bit of information that you're missing to help make those good decisions is kind of what we were seeing. And then people were being taken advantage of because they were buying cars at the lot where if you got online, they were selling the car online for cheaper. But you know, people are just trusting and you think, oh, well, you know, you're going to work with me on this. And then they're being completely taken advantage. Of. Like we get back and like, well, this car is actually listed. You're paying more than what they're actually asking. Like, um, it just, it was very interesting that, um, so really just helping people make, empower them to negotiate and look at other things and research and get online and look outside your area, even though I know that we're rural, um, were kind of some of the barriers that we were facing. And, um, it really helped us to kind of impact, you know, to, to address those with them. So. so I could jump in here. Um, I guess one thing I'm really looking forward to. So right now we have the Rolling Grez Arts Unit, which we partnered with um, a couple different CDFIs, uh, Lakota Funds, Art Space, uh, First Peoples Funds in Rapid City on a mobile bus that we take out twice a month to kind of go to the community, different communities. While being a, also a native CDFI, you know, allows us to apply for all them big, nice grants. <laughs> While the one that we were awarded recently, we were able to, to have the means to purchase our own bus. I am super stoked for this because now what that means for our members is we'll be able to be out in the community five days a week. You know, we'll be able to hit all the communities. On the reservation, there's nine communities, nine districts, um, and they're, they're spread at least 40 miles apart, you know? And so this gives us the opportunity to take our products and services out into the communities to the members who, who don't have means of transportation, who maybe not even have the means to, you know, pay for gas to get here. You know, that, that's, that's huge for our credit. That's huge for our reservation and huge for our people. And I'm super excited about it. You know, it's, it's, it's coming 2022. And, and with the, maybe if we do get approved for the expansion in Rosebud, you know, that also gives us the means to serve the Rosebud reservation. So. So that's kind of something big. And, and it goes along with education too. You know, there's people who live 45 miles away from us who still don't know who we are or we exist. So, you know, or what we can offer. And this gives us that, that opportunity to get out there. And, you know, word of mouth is huge on our reservation. And to be able to tell two people who we are, that's going to tell 20 people. You know, it's, it's all good and it's, it's very exciting. And I, and I can't wait for that to happen. So that's kind of what's new for the credit union and, and what's up and coming. So I can't wait to see what kind of impact that has on the credit union and the communities. It's, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> I'll turn it over to, to Monica. I have so many questions about your bank bus. So I'm, I'm just taking some notes because I'm going to be emailing you. We, uh, you know, we have the same, the same situation um, just with access, physical access, right? Which, you know, when you add the technology element that helps tremendously in some regards, but in some areas we're, we're actually kind of backwards where um, we found that it, you know, we can be incredibly effective with human interaction and the face-to-face -face presence. And so that can only happen oftentimes with this mobile idea, right? With this idea of going out into those communities and bringing in 
um, a team who can educate in their language, right? Whether it's actually a different language or it's just a fa familiar face or a family member. Um, and so we're actually hoping to get a grant soon here. Shana, you could probably help us with this to, to build a bank bus. But again, we only have one road and there's like 20 single lane bridges. So that our bank bus will need to be like a sprinter four by four or something. Um, but during, actually we had a, a huge hurricane in the early nineties and our credit union built a mobile bank bus that was kind of like an RV and did the same thing. So we wanna bring it back. Um, but yeah, just kind of going back to the same concept of, um, you know, it's, it's a, the technology piece is interesting because, you know, I come from like more urban, uh, I'm a millennial, I'm a digital native. So automatically I want to like throw in, let's get the coolest app ever. Like that'll do it. But I have to remember that, you know, the member need, the audience isn't the same in, in all areas. And so for really acutely focusing on the native community, especially technology has its place for sure. And, and it will help. And we're still kind of digging into that. And so does, again, like, you know, reemphasizing that human connection, which is like the, I think the cultural competitive advantage in the whole thing is if anything we're being taught, um, you know, I personally am learning so much from the native and the indigenous community here, their, their entire way of life and system of sustaining themselves for generations and generations is the credit union model. It's like the economic credit union model to scale and everything and the way that they define wealth, it like kind of blows my mind and humbles all of us because it's not GDP or this like upward growth. It's this idea that you can regenerate yourself and take care of everybody together. Um, so just this, you know, idea that, that, you know, these are, we don't, we're not on a, on tribal lands like you, Shana, we don't have just native communities as our members. We have a me big melting pot of communities and we're in MDI. So um, I don't think actually Hawaii does not have an ethnic majority um, in general. So, you know, it's just a, a giant melting pot and there's lots of plantation workers that came from generations and generations ago from Japan or the Philippines. So it's an incredible mix of humans. And we all, um, you know, we all are kind of learning together how to coexist and bring all of our cultures together to create this really interesting dynamic credit union that's trying to serve everyone. Um, by looking backwards and looking forwards to do it. So great stories. More bank bus info, please, Shana. So I've been trying to, everybody's got all these really terrific stories. Um, and I've been trying to think of what, what might be the best thing for me to share um, uh, in, in relation to what's going on for our future. And I think that what I want to tell you all about is our business development uh, center that we opened last year. We call it the Commons at TFCU. And it's a business development and education center. And we are, we do, um, we do farmers markets in the summer. We sponsor farmers markets every month in the summer. And right now we are sponsoring uh, their weekend local Saturday markets inside the building. We've rented a small space inside our building for to a coffee shop. So they kind of keep the home fires burning. It's a really nice place to go in and to enjoy, but the big common area is the credit unions. And that's where people go in and do their Saturday markets. And then we also do, um, periodic business power hour educational uh, things to help small businesses. The whole point is to help small businesses, support small businesses in some way, um, including that coffee shop, which happens to be a brand new business in, in our community. Um, we also have some office rentals in there that we provide. One of them is rented to uh, Grow Ketchikan, which is a um, economic development, little nonprofit economic development organization. Um, and so in the future, though, what we're trying to do, for example, in Metlakatla, they have a nice community room that we built when we built our branch. And so we want to be incorporating what we're doing at the commons in, um, in, in each of our locations as well. So we're really kind of thinking about what does the community development part of CDFI mean to us? And, um, and we're ramping up our business services. We have a whole plethora of business lending. We have two commercial loan officers now, and we're providing financing in uh, our native communities and to small businesses in those communities. And I think one of the things that's really unique about what we do for uh, financing small business is in Metlakatla. 
where we provide uh, financing for bot purchasing commercial fishing boats and using their fish tickets as income verification. So um, over on Annette Island in Metlakatla, they are not required to file tax returns on their fishing income that is uh, derived from tribal waters. And so the only income verification they have are their fish tickets, which shows how much that they sold that year. So we, we use that to provide uh, financing on commercial fishing vessels, which I think is kind of an outside the box thing, but it's worked really well for us and they're able to continue to fish in their tribal waters. And um, yeah, so I think our future right now, that's one of the things that we're focusing on besides just continuing to provide locations in um, the tiny communities of Southeast Alaska that there are no roads to all of our communities. There's just there's no roads. You you fly or you ferry. So it's very expensive to go somewhere to get, um, you know, banking services. So you need a mobile bank plane, uh, or a, or a ferry maybe. <laughs> Ferries would be more reliable. The planes don't always fly, which just happened to me last week. I got I got weathered out. Uh, Thank you all so much. And just been peeping at the chat and there's so many questions and, and comments for the four of you. Um, before we, and we wanna make sure we have time for audience, um, the audience's questions. Before we turn it over to them, um, wanted to just pause and you know, ask the four of you about resources. Um, if there are any resources that would be helpful in advancing your goals and moving closer towards um, the goals that you just uh, you know, shared with us, or if you have resources that you would like to re recommend with our audience if they are interested in learning more about the many topics that, um, that you raised today. I mean, at CDFI, it's already been said, that's invaluable. I don't know if any of you all have gotten that, but that's invaluable. Their inclusive has been really helpful. I put it in the chat, Awista has been really helpful with that. People on this call, I know I reached out to Shana back in the day, um, using, we use all of our resources, right? So I think I put it in the chat, we use CPD, like we pay for the bundling so we can train our staff, so we can train our board members. Like we want to pay for the one and train as many people as we can with it. Um, I think that, you know, those are all really great resources. Even in CUA with Cure has been helpful. So I don't know who anybody else has used. Oh yeah. We've, we've gotten some grant funding for, because we're low income designated credit union as well. We've gotten some grant funding through Cure uh, to open a couple of our sites. And um, yeah, and being a CDFI, being low income designated, those are things that really help you. The low income designation has been great for us because that we can, uh, our, our lending limits are not, you know, managed by what you would find normally in, uh, you know, for re required for credit union. So our commercial lending limits are higher because of that. There is no limit. We can set it in policy and that's helped us a lot. I think one of the things that's hard and I, and Shana, I was thinking of you when you said, oh, we're starting to do mortgage lending on our, you know, tribal trust lands. We also provide mortgage lending in Metlakala and, um, and we do HUD 184 loans through First Tribal over there. And I think that the hard part is um, getting things done through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So if we're talking challenges, that is something that's a frustration to me because I feel almost like it might be kind of backwards um, and maybe some things need to change because um, if you're a Alaska Native or American Indian, you should be able to buy a home on your, on your tribal lands and it shouldn't be such a, a problem to get, get to home ownership. Definitely agree with you. Definitely agree with you. Um, I know Jason at Paulson, they, they had it figured out. I was so impressed with them up there. Um, I think probably, I don't know, that's definitely a challenge for us um, that we're working out. And, and all of the resources the gal said is spot on. You know, the native CDFI network, um, OISTA, uh, in South Dakota here, we have the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition. You know, they have a booklet out about how to do mortgages on trust land. I mean, there's there's tons and tons of resources out there for the credit union side. You know, I work with our local Dakota Credit Union Association, Amy Kleinschmidt. I mean, there's there's always someone out there if you have an issue and, and it's always best just to reach out. And I always found everyone so welcoming um, in this 
any, any, any resource that I could think of, you know, that I didn't say, I'll definitely help. Um, I know Brian Gately was kind of uh, mess on the chat earlier. He definitely helped Tani get the, the credit union ball going. He's helping with the expansion. There's, there's always people out there who want to, everyone to succeed. So it's, it's nice to be in this type of network and, and to see everyone help each other. So uh, thank you guys again. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add to, I, I piggyback every resource that's listed and we can probably list those out. Um, one area we've seen, so because Kauai has, um, for, for whatever reason, I mean, obviously it's a beautiful place, but we've attracted a lot of billionaires and really high net worth folks to the island recently. I'd say in the last five years, I, I think they're calling it like the Zuckerberg effect once he bought land here and started building and then I think the whole a bunch of the club started coming over. Um, the cool part about that is, you know, that's, it's a controversial, I think who knows what the opinion is of everyone on that, but the cool part is there's a lot of philanthropic dollars available to help build the community, economic development, economic resiliency. Um, and so we, as a CDFI, as an MDI, as an LI, we really are positioned to help facilitate those funds and to help articulate to those impact investment dollars where it can go into our an economy and build a more inclusive economy. Um, and so, you know, C-Note is another organization that's been a big help to us in, with impact investing. And they, they focus a lot on CDFIs too. And um, I know Inclusive knows them really well. So really right now, you know, it feels like there's a lot of high net worth out there and they want to put their money to, and foundations and they wanna put their money towards build, building more inclusive economies. So we're like that perfect kind of credible source to represent that and bring those funds into our people and our communities. Thank you all for sharing that. And after the webinar, we'll share a list of some of the resources um, and organizations to follow. You heard um, of OISTA, which is a national network of native uh, CDFI, predominantly loan funds, but they put on tremendous events and are just such a leader in this movement. Also, NDN Collective, um, a couple of other books that you know we've been discussing have been um, Edgar Villanueva's um, Decolonizing Wealth, as well as uh, Braiding um, Sweetgrass. So again, we'll share this with um, folks after today's um, webinar. Um, but at this point, I want to turn it back over to, to Monica and all the questions that are coming through our chat right now from our, our, our audience. Thank you, Kathy, and thanks everybody for uh, your great discussion. It's been really wonderful hearing about your credit unions. I do wanna open the floor up for any of the um, people who are on the line um, to ask your questions. Um, one question that uh, came in earlier, we want to make sure if, if, you know, folks didn't have a chance to answer it, I think Stephanie did. Um, who does your financial counseling at your credit unions? And do you have dedicated staff or is everyone trained or exposed to um, provide financial education? So anyone want to share what they're doing in terms of financial education at your credit unions? We um, have a partnership with Balance and they have, they provide some really wonderful um, additional resources besides what we're able to do internally, but we also have uh, certified financial counselors at the credit union. In fact, we paid um, employees a uh, stipend if they completed their financial counseling. So um, we have a few of them on staff and they're available for one-on-one -on -one counseling to members who might need them. We, yeah, we also, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say like, honestly, if you buy the bundling, I don't wanna push a product, but. And then balance, balance is great and Green Path are great. And those are all awesome. And I love that. There are also extra resources if you're overloaded and you need to outsource. But the most success we've had is when it's like internal, right? People trusting people, talking about people, you know your people, you know how they're living and what's going on. I just can't say enough of that. And so when, when we thought about spending money and you look at CUNA's, you know, CPD bundled package with your e-schools, I mean, it's the supervisory committee, it's the board members, it's all of the employees, it's everybody because you're all providing financial education, just sitting around the dinner table, right? And I mean, you know, just out and about, oh, you're gonna buy a new car. Well, hey, let me tell you this, 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 and this. And if you want more information, go up to the credit unit. You know what I mean? Like it's, I guess maybe because we're on the tribal land that that network, the human network is so much more important. I don't, I love balance. I love green path. I think those are all great. 
but um, I just can't say enough for just the knowing you and talking to you and that connection that you have with people. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you guys. One extra thing I would like to add is we do um, $500 loans, the uh, credit builder loans. And when we do that, we created a pamphlet of a financial education pamphlet that kind of goes through and helps people rebuild their credit. And that's one of been a, one of the best products that we've been able to offer that actually leads to um, some really strong improvements in, in people's uh, financial lives. Thank you. Um, we have at least two more questions. I'm going to try to squeeze them in. <laughs> one is about um, if you're able to share and feel comfortable sharing, what are some interesting cultural nuances that credit unions um, that you're experiencing or your members show um, that are specific to better serving Native American members? Um, you know, maybe is there anything that you can share that you know others either who have Native American communities locally that they might be able to sort of think about um, whether again from a cultural perspective. And in this case, that the, the um, person mentioned. Um, life insurance. So for example, African-Americans buying um, have a higher propensity to buy life insurance. So do you, did you notice anything in particular regarding your products or services or what your members are asking for that might have a cultural component? Can I say one thing? I know that there's always a lot of talk about like real estate loans for the tribal land too. And that is a thing. But also what we found was that we had a lot of our, they lease it out to tenant farmers, right? And so then we, I just say like, you probably have people too that are, they own the land, but they're leasing it out to tenant farmers and they're going to get paid once a year when the harvest comes in. So even just offering loans against, we just call them lease loans, right? Against that. So that when the harvest comes in and then they're getting paid, like it's a one-time balloon payment due after the harvest, just because, you know, they're not trying to build on it. That land is for farming. They are not the ones farming it. Um, but you know what I mean? I think that that just, I guess that comes from knowing your members and like what's going on in their lives. But I think that that I don't I we always talk about just the real estate loan side of it, but I don't know that we're talking about the other side of it when they're leasing it out. Thank you, Stephanie. Anybody else want to weigh in? Re reactions or thoughts to that question? So I guess um, I know earlier I kind of mentioned about um, the like everyone kind of shying away from the word federal, and of course. You know, everybody knows that the federal government and Native Americans did not everywhere, Native Americans everywhere, Hawaii, Alaska, did not have the greatest, you know, greatest relationship with, with the federal government. Um, and I think the fact that we have so many people passionate about this work and, and willing to get out there and, and, and educate on who we are and what we do is, is a big thing um, that don't necessarily, I guess it kind of goes around cultural because it, there's that kind of hesitation, but we have so many people, you know, definitely passionate about about the work we do and, and how we can help people. I think that everyone is getting used to this idea now, especially on our reservation um, of who we are, just education, all, always back to education and getting out in the communities. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question or a little bit about it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and I was gonna say, I don't know, like maybe Shannon can talk about this. I think the, the federal is not the problem for us. It was trying to get people to re remember that the tribe doesn't actually own the credit union. Like it's not actually the tribe's credit union. So I don't know, like our problem was just like, that was a hurdle, like that education uh, on that topic was, was our thing. That's really interesting. Um, so then I guess I'm, I'm imagining you, you end up saying that the members own the credit union and not the tribe. Is that the counter? Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna relay that to them. Um, so then uh, we had a question about uh, real estate. Um, somebody was asking about real estate lending or the real estate loans, like if you had any resources. And I see that Kathy Kim did put a link, Roxy, for the guide, an OCC treasury guide. Um, but if anybody else has any um, particular leads on real estate loans, I think somebody mentioned a brochure or a guide. Yep, so the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition is, is uh, of course in South Dakota, they have an actual like booklet, like a hand, hand guide that breaks it down from going into your local tribal land office to walking it through BIA, it's, it's, it's pretty lengthy. Um, they had it broke down between all of the reservations in South Dakota. Uh, I don't know if that will help from out of South Dakota, but it's definitely kind of a, a, um, a starting point, I guess, that you know, I'll definitely be willing to share. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, and, you know, just for anybody who's on the call, we'll try to, um, again, I mentioned, um, I think Kathy mentioned it, we'll try to put these links that were these good resources that everybody's been sharing um, in the response email um, with the recording. <laughs> um, but just maybe to end on a, a positive note, um, does anybody want to share any successful initiatives or a positive member story that, you know, is particularly meaningful to you that kind of gets you through your day or that you think about um, as we wrap up? Well, I can't tell it as well as Denise, our branch manager in Metlakatla, but um, she did a credit builder loan, a $500 credit builder loan for someone. This has been several years ago and, uh, and they were in their thirties. They'd only bought, you know, things with cash. They'd never had any credit. So she got them a credit builder loan. She got them a share secured visa. They started building a credit score. They went on to purchase a car and then they went on to purchase a home and they even purchased an investment property. And, and she told the story far more beautifully than that, but it was really moving to hear that you can go from zero, you know, to a financial wellness uh, by starting with a $500 credit builder loan. And we have many stories where the credit builder loan has gotten people into um, their, their dream homes or their vehicles. And it doesn't take years and years, really. It, it, it's just like being consistent and paying on time. And in a couple of years, you can be in a new home. And it's pretty wonderful to see what people do with that um, very small and simple product. Thank you, Ellen. All right, any last words from the group? Do you have anything else you wanna share? Last thoughts? Um, I always, I tell this every time I have to talk in, in front of everybody, but it's, it's such a, a feel good moment. Um, you know, we have generational accounts now, you know, it's the first time grandma had an account ever. And now grandma's daughter's first time she ever had an account. Now the grandkids have accounts, you know what I mean? That's, that's something we haven't seen here in a really long time. And it's always good to tell that story. <laughs> that's really wonderful. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, everybody for um, being with us today. Um, you know, this is our <laughs> uh, celebration for uh, Native American Heritage Month, but, but we think, you know, we'd love to have you guys back or, you know, have a part in the discussion um, on any particular topics that you feel are relevant to your communities. And so we just want to lift them up and um, let people know what's going on and particularly how we can be better um, allies and advocates for these um, issues. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. And we look forward to following up with you by, with the recording and uh, links. So have a great day. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>